So, all right. Welcome, everyone, to this uh, webinar uh, arranged by the ENS Trauma Section. My name is Niklas Marklund, Professor of Neurosurgery in Lund, Sweden. And I hear that we have many participants um, today, which is really rewarding, and I hope you will enjoy this seminar on coagulation. Uh, we realized in Barcelona at the ENS Congress that there's a huge interest of coagulation issues and, and problems in traumatic brain injury. So that's why we have this webinar today. So uh, we have an excellent uh, set of panelists here. I will introduce them as we go along. Um, uh, I want to just to say, may I guess many of you will have questions. So we ask you to put the questions in the Q&A box. You feel free to use the chat box as well if you want to say hi to your friends or whatever you see on, on as participants. But for questions, please use the Q&A uh, Q box. And we'll try to resp respond to as many as we have time for. All right, I think I can set, uh, start. Let's see if hope this works. So, right, so I will have a quick introduction and then go on to the prevention of thromboembolic events in TBI. As I said, I work in Lund in, in Sweden. So, and this is the, the panelist of today. We talk about coagulation management and traumatic brain injury. And the other um, panelists are truly experts in the field. We have Mark Megale, a trauma surgeon, Cologne, uh, one of the key experts in the world, I would say, on coagulopathy. Uh, and he will talk about coagulopathy and hemorrhagic progression in TBI. Uh, Tony Belli, also a true expert in coagulation management and been uh, in instrumental in the tranexamic acid uh, studies. Talk about tranexamic acid, how to use that in TBI, and reversal of antiplatelet agents. And last but not least, Bart de Plettere, who is our, our chair of the trauma section, talk about reversal and restart of anticoagulant drugs uh, following TBI. Yes, some introduction. Uh, two hours post-injury, you see small um, hemorrhagic lesions in the frontal lobe. Uh, 16 hours later, huge progression of these lesions. Coagulopathy and impaired coagulation TBI is truly a killer and it impairs the outcome tremendously. It's also something that we can treat and we can manage. Um, we should be aware that TBI itself leads to coagulopathy. Almost two-thirds of severe TBI patients have ab abnormal coagulation when they arrive at the ER. And also coagulopathy, as I said, is linked to poor outcome with mort mortality very high. Uh, you see the numbers there. And also who gets it? Um, this uh, excellent center of TBI studies. Um, almost uh, more than 4,000 patients, 20% of them had coagulopathy, and the risk factors were um, GCS less than 8, uh, base excess less than minus 6, and hypothermia and hypotension on, on arrival. You just be aware when the patients get it. This is a good time course. We have um, the, the, platelet, the platelet count and platelet function, which is impaired for um, up to 72 hours, even up to two weeks post-injury, and we have impaired coagulation Lab value is also very early post injury by the TBI itself. You will hear more about how to manage this, but in general, we can keep the fibrinogen more than 1.5 or 2. We can debate what level is perfect. Early tranexamic acid will be um, addressed by Professor Belli. Correct hypothermia, correct acidosis, correct anemia. Again, debatable at what level um, the hemoglobin should, when the patient should be transfused. And as you know, a key issue in TBI these days is that we have um, much of the elderly patients, the, the cohorts are getting elderly by uh, each year almost. And of course, there are a lot of antithrombotic drugs. And just in general, we have two classes of antithrombotic drugs, anticoagulants and antiplatelet agents. And this will be addressed in this webinar. Um, this Norwegian study has stated that you see the increasing number of patients who are on uh, anticoagulants. Uh, the DOAX in particular is increasing, whereas warfarin is decreasing. And also still steadily rising number of patients on antiplatelet drugs. So this will be an increasing problem in the years uh, to come. There are many risk factors. This CHATS2 score is a good one. It has a general um, vascular risk factors. But of course, you see here, the age factors is the true risk factor for thromboembolic complications. This was, that, this was some short introductory slides so to get you in the mood of coagulation problems in TBI. 
So I will start to perhaps the less uh, hot topics in this, which is the uh, um, prevention and thromboprophylaxis of uh, prophylaxis against uh, deep venous thrombosis and pulmonary emboli. You may consider this oh so boring since you all want to do cool skull base or clipping or whatever. And why should I bother about this? My patients do great. But as you know, not least in TBI, if you get a DVT or particular pulmonary emboli, that's morbidity and a lot of mortality as well. And it seems that many neurosurgeons are truly afraid of giving anything that will impair coagulation to these patients. But hope, hope I can guide you when to give um, patients um, prophylaxis against DVT and pulmonary embolus. Um, just some short basics on the venous thromboembolisms. First, the DVTs, deep vein thrombosis, is commonly, of course, the deep veins in the lower extremities. If it's in the distal, uh, in the um, distal to the popliteal vein, it has no serious consequences, but 20% or more will extend more proximal. And if you have proximal um, DVTs, you get into the popliteal vein, the femoral vein, the iliac veins, and of course, then that will lead to a risk of pulmonary emboli. And of course, the pulmonary embolism, they commonly occur or originate in the deep venous uh, system of the legs. Unusual or, you know, the other veins, deep pelvic veins, axillary veins even. So, but I think the last sentence is important. 70% of patients with pulmonary emboli have evidence of DVT. And even more importantly, 50% of patients presenting with DVT already have signs of pulmonary embolus. I will not go into much into the, uh, the diagnosis, but of course the clinical features, you have cough or leg pain, difficult to assess in the, the severe TBI patient tenderness, swelling, discoloration, etc. And there are, maybe you have it in your own hospitals, there are some formulas that develop to diagnose this. We, we don't use the D-dimers, they're quite unspecific in TBI. The same goes for pulmonary emboli, it's non-specific symptoms. Uh, if you get the massive um, 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 problems with circulation and saturation, Obviously, that's that, that's another thing, but you have to be a high, high, high degree of suspicion for pulmonary emboli. But dyspnea, tachypnea in the wake patients, chest tightness, the same there. But if it gets massive, you get right-sided heart failure and you can get um, hypotension from it. And generally, since we have many elderly patients, the longer you stay in the ICU, higher risk, older age, uh, actually male sex in this particular study, if you're bedridden, if you get infectious problems, and if you have all the other vascular risk factors, if you're a cortisone, glucocorticoids, uh, and some other lab parameters. Yeah, yeah here you have the, um, um, the citation for that. It's also meta and meta analysis of various risk factors. Uh, we can just go into TBI mechanism. Actually, penetrating TBIs have a higher risk of DVT and pulmonary embolus. Higher age. Um, obviously, actually also higher uh, body mass index and obesity, uh, and also male male sex. It's actually a very good one. You can check into that uh, paper if you have time. Again, back to this chat score is very. It's actually a very good tool to assess what what risk a particular patient has for developing thromboembolic uh, complications. And I will just uh, take a. Uh, a case, illustrative case, uh, how, how problematic it can be. We have this TBI patient, 55-year-old woman. She's healthy, some anxiety problems, maybe uh, alcohol consumptions in excess. Uh, she found at the bottom of the flight of stairs, start with GCS-12, was still responsive pupils. But she rapidly deteriorates. GCS-7 is transported uh, to our department after intubation. Doesn't look much, but you have some hemorrhagic uh, contusions, some uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, subdural hematoma. Um, she is complicated by a burst fracture of the C3 vertebra. So she gets ICP monitoring since she is unconscious. Surprisingly, a lot of ICP problem initially, up to 40 millimeters mercury if sedation is decreased. So she gets an EVD. You see the EVD here? Not so much mass effect on this CT. We still have remaining ICP problem, heavy sedation that goes on even up to six days. This is one reason why the DVT prophylaxis was delayed. 
She also needed the surgery for her burst fracture. She was so unstable in ICP, we had to delay that at once. But finally, on day eight, we did the C3 corpectomy with an anterior effusion C2 to C4. But still, surprisingly, with that CT image, and with this, this is double and triple check, this, the ICP is very problematic. It's still high on day 12. And then suddenly, she gets severe circulatory and respiratory problems. The blood pressure drops to 70 to 80, systolic blood pressure. Saturation drops. CPP goes down to 40. On CT, is a huge saddle embolus and pulmonary emboli. Life-threatening condition, so she's given thrombolysis. This is five days after surgery for the C3 corpectomy. So it gets ICP-80, blood in the CSF when the external ventricular drain is opened. And she also gets a very tense swelling at the cervical area where the incision was made for the um, corpectomy. So that was evacuated. This was the pulmonary emboli. See some more blood in the ventricles like this. ICP is very high. So we started wondering what, what to do. So we actually took out the left hygroma with the burr hole. ICP goes down to three. We still still had the issue with the um, the pulmonary pulmonary embolus was really life threatening. So we placed this vena cava filter. We'll talk about that later. ICP increased again. So right sided hygroma was evacuated. And finally, after some initial some continuous problems, ICP was better, and the patient survived with the with a good outcome, um, surprisingly. So, uh, so this is a complex case, but this also illustrates some of the problems. Could we have prevented this pulmonary pulmonary embolus? Well, what what did we do? Is she received compression stockings after some delay, day five, uh, low molecular weight heparins, and when we had this problem, we placed an inferior vena cava filter. So the, the importance of DVT and pulmonary embolus prophylaxis, when should we do it and with what? And we can always start, as we always do, with the Brain Trauma Foundation recommendations, no level one or level two um, recommendations. They say that low molecular weight heparins or low dose unfractionated heparin may be used in combination with mechanical prophylaxis. They state here there's an increased risk for expansion of intracranial hemorrhages. If you look at the literature they, they have, there is like up to 50% incidence of DVT without prophylaxis in TBI. It's age, injury severity score, and extremity injury logical uh, predictors of DVT. And you have a highly increased risk despite the use of um, mechanical and chemical prophylaxis. And the more severe the TBI, the higher the, the risk of venous thromboembolic events. A more re a recent one, Neurocritical Care Society. Well, this severe TBI obviously is an independent risk factor for DVT uh, uh, in polytrauma patients. Of course, pro decreased mobility, prolonged ventilation, and the activations of procoagulant uh, pro factors. So if we get delayed or no prophylaxis, at least 13 to 17% of DVT, of which many will get pulmonary embolus. And this particular study, if you wait more than four days, you have an, uh, up to three times higher risk of DVTs than if you start earlier. Also, retrospective review, if you delay more than 40 hour, 48 hours, you have also an increased risk of developing DVT. So their recommendation is you use this intermittent pneumatic compression boots uh, within 24 hours. And you can start low molecular weight heparins or the unfractionated heparin within 24 to 48 hours or if you've done the craniotomy, about uh, around 24 hours after that craniotomy. But wait a minute, so if you give prophylaxis too early, can't you give hemorrhagic, hem hemorrhagic complication? That was stated by the Brain Trauma Foundation. Well, this particular study, 500 patients, 3.4% uh, had uh, progressive hemorrhagic CT changes uh, if we gave the low molecular weight heparins uh, within 48 hours. Uh, six of those had a change of all treatment, three who required craniotomy from 2008. So it's getting a little bit old. Same with this study, higher higher number of patients, where they also state that patients receiving low molecular weight heparin were at higher risk for hemorrhage progression. And they also stated the risk of using low molecular weight heparin may exceed this benefit. It's rather harsh statements. This is from 2012. 
But now this increasing um, number of paper and the literature is increasingly stating that no, if you give early chemical trauma prophylaxis, like this very recent one, it does not increase the risk of intracranial hematoma in patients with TBI. And here, I, they say more than 300 patients in this particular study. So, And there was no, um, those who received you know, chemo prophylaxis in this study, there were no trauma embolic events and there were no sort of hemorrhagic uh, complications to it. So I'll come back with the final recommendations of this, but what should we use? Well, a uh, huge study here of which, of which 11,000 patients received low molecular weight heparins. And when you used that, there was a decreased risk of mortality, also this, uh, decreased risk of pulmonary, pulmonary emboli. And there was also um, the risks of reduced, uh, sorry, the reduced mortality and the reduced risk of uh, pulmonary, pulmonary emboli was also better when compared to unfractionated heparin. We will start looking at uh, body mass index, but also um, they stated in a huge number of patients that for every hour delayed in initiating prophylaxis, there was a higher risk of developing uh, these trauma embolic events. And also they treated those with unfractionated heparin, they were more likely to develop um, the, these trauma embolic complications, increased mortality compared to low molecular weight heparin. So it means the the evidence is in favor of the low molecular weight heparins instead of the unfractionated heparin, like this. So, and also with this meta-analysis I mentioned before, with same same findings as uh, low molecular weight low molecular weight heparins uh, are better than or have a better safety profile and improves outcome more than uh, unfractionated heparin, like this. There's always something else in, in um, medicine, but if you use um, the unfractionated heparins, they're cleared by hepatic and renal mechanisms. But if you have low molecular weight heparins, it's, it's only basically on renal clearance. So if you have patients with renal insufficiency, then there may, may be a place or a role for unfractionated heparin. And we can give them for... Depends, of course, the risk factors, mobilization of the patient, paresis, other risk factors such as typically seven to ten days uh, um, as a standard for, for the prophylaxis. The American College of Surgeons recommendations also do good overviews. They state that you should give within the first 72 hours to most patients. And I underline what I think personally is the most critical thing. You have a stable repeat head CT scan. If you do see an, another CT scan of like 24 hours and nothing has happened, no hemorrhagic progression, then the, the hemorrhage is stable, then it's safe to give a prophylaxis. They also state that you can give the prophylactic inferior vena cava filter and those with high risk for thromboembolic complications and high risk for intracranial complications like this. So this should basically be in your toolbox with very complicated patients there that, and where you, for some reason, cannot give the regular chemo prophylaxis. Just a few words on that. Um, if you have a, a proximal deep venous thrombosis, contraindications, then you may use this uh, inferior vena cava filters. Um, they, are, sorry, they are placed below the renal veins at the L3, L4, typically. And also this big study, there was, I was surprised to see that there was very few that actually had their cava filters removed, but also said if you keep them in for a long time, there's no, there's not, they're not associated with a re reduced risk of mortality. And they, in this study, uh, with a huge number of patients, it did not prevent future pulmonary emboli. So it's not the perfect tool, but it's one tool you should have in your toolbox for those patients like a very recent pulmonary embolism, for some reason you cannot give a prophylaxis, then this can be considered. So finally, some few words on pediatric TBIs. Of course, the younger you are, the less the risk is, but they are in general for, for pediatric patients, the risk factor is um, increasing age. Same here, also a high body mass index and severe injuries. Um, those, those few that I've seen in pediatric TBI patients, typically those would have a, um, a central venous line for a long time. So it's one known risk factors. And also if you get pneumonias afterwards. So what to think about pediatric TBIs? Do you really need to give them prophylaxis? Well, 
it seems that there are no clear-cut guidelines, but it seems that at least if you're more than 15 years old, absolutely, like the adult, 12 to 15 years old, well, it depends if you, if you reach puberty or not. If you reach puberty, then you can be considered like, like a young adult and give prophylaxis. If you're less than 12, then I guess there's the individual assessment and we should weigh the risk versus the benefits of them. Um, of the prophylaxis and this the CT image and uh, other risk factors. So, but as in, in general, pediatric patients have much less risk than the the elderly patient, of course. So, so time my time is running up. So conclusions: um, we can can start within twenty four hours of in in practically as soon as possible. The intermittent intermittent dramatic compression like this one on the image. Low molecular weight heparin seems to be better than non-fractionated heparin, and could in most patients be started within 48 hours. Key thing, the CT image should be stable. Do repeat CT scan, and if the um, hemorrhage has not um, progressed, then it means the CT is stable, and then you can start in absolute majority of patients. So the screen for DVTs and pulmonary amylis, we don't. d dimer is very unspecific. Just use a high degree of suspicion is needed. So this is obviously complicated. But I hope I've provided you with some, some guidelines and some ideas on how to manage this patient. If we don't give anything, we will lose patients for the pulmonary emboli. So it's, it can be a truly a killer. So I will just end with recommending you to come to a few meetings. There's still a possibility to come to Munich and, and next week. There's, um, you can uh, register on site to the first ever European Neurotrauma Organization meeting. And I'd also like to welcome you to uh, the Nordic Neurotrauma Congress or conference in um, in Lund, November 27 to 29. We have an excellent program there. So with this, I will stop. So I can just do like this. See, we have something in the uh, Q&A. So I can stop sharing my thing there. We have nothing in the Q&A box yet. So we can um, probably wrap up with some questions later on. So uh, then I'm very happy to give the words to Mark Megele, who will uh, you know, address a very important topics in, in TBI management and correlation. So Mark, please. Um, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Nicholas. Um, thank you for your uh, society inviting me um, again. Uh, I've been uh, already invited to Barcelona where we had an excellent um, session um, actually on the same topic with a very um, intensified discussion thereafter, um, highlighting highlighting specific aspects around um, coagulation or hemostatic disorders. Um, and um, in particular, um, the risk of hemorrhagic progression um, along with uh, traumatic brain injury. And thanks again for, for having me in this um, ENS webinar. So my name is Mark Megaly and I'm a trauma surgeon um, at the um, Cologne Mayhem Medical Center. I'm also um, head of our um, um, local research department associated with our, our university. And some, so a little bit about my background is that I've been involved in several pan-European large-scale um, um, clinical studies um, and also experimental studies in unveiling um, the, the mechanisms and the secrets uh, behind um, hemostatic disorders um, um, in the context of, of traumatic brain injury. And I'm very happy to, to, to share some of some of our recent findings and some of um, our thoughts um, we have on, on, on this, especially when it comes to early detection, risk stratification, and treatment of, 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 um, of, um, of these um, patients. Um, we, know, we all know that um, essentially uh, we, we, we are facing a, a changing epidemiology of, of trauma um, and at this, uh, during these um, um, years and, and, and times, and already outlined by, by Nicholas. Um, it's not the the young risk taker um, um, anymore, you know, um, riding his motorcycle and being involved in a, in a severe traffic accident. It's it's more and more the the elderly um, uh, with low level falls um, um, under under um, different forms of medication, especially that has already been mentioned, anticoagulant um, drugs, um, antiplatelet drugs. Um, who sustains a, a traumatic brain injury. And um, if we look at the data,
data, and, and this is just an example, um, this is a large retrospective registry analysis that came out from the colleagues in, in, in the Netherlands uh, 2020, that there remain to be two major um, killers um, associated with, with trauma. And, and the vast majority of, of patients that actually do die within the first um, first hours and later sequelae, um, um, or they die from trauma, traumatic brain injury. Um, and um, another substantial proportion of those patients that die very early are those uh, with um, hemostatic um, disturbances and, and, and coagulopathies. Um, and um, actually when, when, um, a, when TBI is coincidence with uh, what we call the coagulopathy of trauma, how, and, and when you look at these numbers, you, 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 you quite see why, why is it so difficult to generate reliable numbers because we still lack um, clear definitions for both on the one hand side, the, the, the traumatic brain injury, and on the other side, obviously, for, for coagulopathy. But if we apply um, our, our classification systems um, today um, at these, um, at these uh, patients, we come up with around a prevalence of, of hemostatic derangements in the TBI populations of around 30, 35%. And when both entities essentially coincidence, um, the mortality of patients already outlined by Nicholas in his um, introductory words is quite increased, and can can be and, and can rise up um, to to fifty or even even high percentages. Um, and the odds ratio for mortality um, when both um, TBI and coagulopathy coincidence, and the odds of ratio for mortality um, um, is is around is around um, 10. And Nicholas already alluded to you the center TBI study, um, basically where we looked at um, 600 patients, um, all severely uh, TBI injured as reflected by the abbreviated injury scale for the brain um, of, um, of greater or equal to three, 80% here. And you look down um, around um, one in, 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 in five uh, patients um, suffered um, suffered um, um, lab at least signs of laboratory uh, coagulopathy. And the overall mortality um, when this coagulopathy was present was also um, quite, quite um, increased. And what I really want <clears throat> to highlight is that um, the um, hemostatic disorders um, in the context of TBI, um, this is a definitely not a, a, a static condition. It's a highly dynamic condition. And, and if you look here um, on the left-hand side, this is an example of a, a patient after having sustained a severe traumatic brain injury um, on admission. Look at the a CT scan. Um, and um, below, um, with it's, it's a little bit deranged coagulation profile, but not substantially. I would consider this rather a, a reference uh, coagulation profile um, as evidenced here by um, the viscoelastic testing trace and also by the, by the um, conventional coagulation assays we uh, ran on that patient. So we paid, put that patient um, on the ICU ward for further um, observation, and then the, the patient um, deteriorated after three hours um, and we put this patient back um, to the CT scan, and you can see here a substantial increase in the intracranial bleeding, along with substantial um, coagulopathy, as evidenced by the viscoelastic um, testing trace. <clears throat> you can see here the curves with a prolonged initiation of the clotting process, a flattened angle um, that um, indicates a substantial delayed um, um, coagulation or, or clotting process and the reduced amplitude um, that reflects um, usually a, um, a disturbed um, 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 a clotting uh, structure. And as you look further down, also the, 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 uh, the, the general profile um, um, of this patient was um, substi substantially um, disturbed. Um, and on the right hand side, um, I, this study is, is almost, a, a, or it's more or less a decade ago, was published by uh, colleagues from the Netherlands. 
Um, but I would like to cite this um, this uh, quite 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 often because it shows you that even when the patient arrives with a compensated coagulation profile, this particular patient can be substantially coagulopathic within the within the hours to come. And the number of patients actually that do develop um, coagulation disorders um, in the context of TBI may double. Um, within the 12, first uh, 24 hours. And this uh, reminds you that specific monitoring also on the time scale in the further development is of utmost importance not to miss those patients because these patients are at extremely high risk um, for further um, hemorrhagic um, progression as then evidenced on the corresponding MCT scanners uh, signs. Um, and this is a just an example. There are, there are quite some some number of uh, papers published um, on hemorrhagic progression along with TBI. This is a, a prospective observational single center study um, from Dresden um, University a Neurosurgical Department on 150 TBI patients. And then those in this particular cohort, um, the frequency of um, hemostatic derangement was around one in two. Um, and um, around, around the same number actually displayed um, hemorrhagic progression um, in the follow-up CT after um, six hours. And the, 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 the existence or the development of hemorrhagic progression in this cohort um, was substantially um, and translated into outcome ahead of hazard ratio for unfavorable outcome um, a discharge of uh, 5.4 and after one year um, of 3.9, and both were highly statistically um, significant. And actually, these are two, um, two um, studies um, taken from, the, from the, 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 the trauma, the general systemic trauma arena, but um, I think they, they, are, they, they hold also true for the TBI um, population. Because when people actually die from exsanguination, they die usually very quickly, on average, um, um, between um, hour four and six um, after um, after after admission um, to the to the hospital. Um, and on the right hand side, this is a, a sub um, um, analysis of the U.S. based uh, PROPA trial. On where the authors looked at specific coagulation management strategies in the bleeding trauma patients. Um, and this sub-study included a, a, a little bit more than 400 patients. Um, and they looked um, about the between the they looked for the impact of timing to um, hemostasis in relation to outcome. And um, in, in, in this cohort of patients, um, when hemostasis was achieved, every minute of decrease in that specific time window to um, hemostasis, this was clearly associated with decreased mortality and secondary um, complications um, in this cohort. And this leads me to the um, recommendation, one of the key messages um, of the um, European Trauma Guideline that has been updated for the sixth time earlier this year, um, is that measure, measures to monitor and support coagulation should be initiated as early as possible um, and used um, to guide um, goal-directed treatment strategies. And there are essentially two ways how you can do it. The one is the one uh, the one uh, pathway to follow is to use conventional coagulation assays, um, but they are uh, they are associated with a specific um, draw clinical drawbacks. Um, as they only monitor the initiation um, of the coagulation um, initiation, the initiation phase of the coagulation process, and only maximum four to six percent of the entire thrombin generation. And thrombin is um, the, the, the essential um, protein, serine protease, that actually converts fibrinogen to fibrin that's later then cross-linked with factor 13 to form a stable clot. Um, and also um, these um, these uh, conventional coagulation assays they are uh, associated with, with quite large um, turnaround times um, for clinical um, decision making. And this brings me to uh, to introduce to you um, this um, viscoelastic um, testing um, assay strategy 
um, based on functional coagulation assays, um, but basically um, you create um, an ex vivo initiation of the clotting process within the cup um, where you basically enter the blood sample drawn from the patient in the emergency department or um, um, at the at, in, in the OR because this this technology can be used as bedside point of care um, and monitoring um, and you activate the coagulation process in the cup by adding a coagulation activator and once there's clot formation there is increase against the rotating cup for example in the left hand sided um, tag assay or against the rotating pin on the right hand sided rotem. And the more the more coagulation, the more stable the clots gets um, in in this in the in this assay, um, the higher is the amplitude um, of your of your of your of your test trace, and this usually then forms the characteristic rotent trace that's seen um, in the middle of this um, in the center of this slide. And this um, basically shows you some some examples of normal clotting or um, a, a scenario where you encounter re reduced clot strength as evidenced here by a reduced um, clot amplitude or delayed clotting that's usually indicated indicative for a, a, a lack of coagulation factors to initiate the clotting phase, the clotting process um, in the cup and and this um, is then um, then um, remarked um, by this by this green line where basically um, the, um, the, the, the clotting process um, in your assay is substantially delayed um, as a consequence of lack of coagulation factors. Um, and last but not least, um, you see um, an example of a typical rotem trace that's indicative for hyperfibrinolysis where essentially the clot initiation phase is, um, is, um, is delayed um, based um, on, the, on, the, on the flattening of the alpha angle the amplitude is reduced, but then the clot breaks down and forms the zero line again, where basically the clot is, is not stable enough to be sustainable and falls apart. And then basically you have no clotting um, existing in the in your individual uh, patient. Um, and uh, for me, I think the, the major advantages of this uh, functional viscoelastic uh, testing is that basically this test uh, provides you this very reliable information on the whole kinetics of, of the hemostatic process in the individual patient. Um, you can see, you have an idea how the initiation of the clotting um, is, is, is developing in the patient as reflected by the clotting time. You have an idea about the dynamics of, of, clot, of the clotting process. And of course, um, of the quality um, of the clotting process as reflected by the, the, the amplitude. And this obviously can be translated into information about the clot stability, firmness, and sustainability. And as outlined previously, um, this, um, this testing asset provides fast results. I will talk about this later, as it can be performed um, as a point of care um, strategy at bedside um, in the emergency department um, on the on the ICU or even um, in the in the OR. And there has been much a debate on how to implement, how to introduce um, this technology into daily clinical practice. And um, I was would like just to 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 remind you that we had in 2014 we had a consensus conference in Philadelphia where for the first time. Um, internationally recognized um, experts um, gathered together um, and based on the literature that was available at that time, agreed on specific rotem tech um, trace values, trigger values, um, and, and, and based on these findings, um, they gave suggestions on how to respond um, to these traces in terms of um, administering specific um, coagulation treatments to individualized patients, as for example, the specific administration of clotting factors such as fibrinogen, um, PPS, PCC, for example, um, or blood products, hypertronic um, uh, acid um, to encounter fibrinolysis, um, which will be a topic of, of, of a later talk today. Um, or even withhold um, um, hemostatic therapy when there is no indication um, um, to give the patient um, um, specific coagulation factors. 
And this again, it was a, a study we conducted in the context of our uh, center TBI network, where we basically wanted to know whether it would be feasible to implement such a rotem or viscoelastic testing based um, algorithm into um, centers treating TBI patients um, initially naive to this technology. We um, staffed um, these centers um, with, with the machines and, and provided specific training to the staff, to the nursing staff, but also to the, to the, to the, to the medical colleagues. Um, we were able to perform this um, feasibility study in for European trauma centers in Germany, Spain, Hungary, and Belgium. And we were able to test this algorithm, the implementation of such an algorithm in the 32 um, patients. And the outcome was here adherence um, to the algorithm and timing of the availability of test results against conventional coagulation assays. And the result was quite convincing because we had complete or observed complete adherence to the algorithm in 20 out of these 32 cases. What we also looked at was um, whether this technology was able to be more sensitive to pick up coagulopathic signals in the individualized patients. And yes, it really was as compared to conventional coagulation assays because only five patients had abnormalities on conventional coagulation assays while 21 of them had abnormalities um, in the uh, rotent um, testing. And this um, was also a very, very nice result we obtained here because the turnaround time for clinical decision-making in, 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 um, in those settings where basically um, the rotem was used to uh, guide or to assess the coagulation system were were substantially shorter when uh, viscoelastic testing assays were applied. Um, and this was evident both for both time intervals between admission and, um, and availability of the test results and the time interval between blood sampling and the um, availability of test results. And adherence, as you can see here on the right-hand side, the, the, the box plots, the adherence to the algorithm was further associated with faster clot issue initiation as evidenced by a decreased um, clotting time um, in the rotem trace and also um, associated with better clot stability and firmness as evidenced by the increased um, amplitude in the rotem trace. And I would like um, to take you with me for a short journey um, into our, our, our medical center here in Cologne. Uh, where we are basically um, at a very short distance from our resuscitation room um, that's um, shown here in the shock room. Um, and this is around 10 meters walk where we have um, installed um, what I would say I would call a, a point of care assessment room. And there we have this fully automated um, Sigma device um, the Rotem device um, installed. And um, once the blood sample is taken, it's immediately transferred into this, um, this, um, this location. Um, and we have usually a nursing uh, a nurse that um, activates uh, the, the Rotem Sigma. And as you can see here, we have a technology in, in implemented it's called Secure View, where we mirror this screen um, onto a large screen in the resuscitation room. And while we take care of the patient, um, we, can, we can see how the coagulation system behaves and we can activate and adopt our treatment um, according um, to our algorithms. And this is again, the algorithm that we have implemented um, and also uh, published um, quite, uh, quite frequently um, 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 in, 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 in our setting. And this is just a, a case of a severe traumatic brain injured uh, patient um, who basically um, fell from a, a tree that where he was a, a woodworker was having sustained a severe contusional um, and traumatic um, brain injury. Um, and this um, was the first um, rotem we uh, detected in this patient um, um, in, the, in, the, in the emergency room. And there are the, the major findings as outlined here in the FIPTAM and the fibrin polymerization test, there was a complete um, zero line, there was no, no coagulation, no fib fibrin polymerization evident in this specific uh, patient. And as you can see here in the, in the XTEM and the MTEM, there, there was a sign of severe hyperfibrinolysis 
that could be reversed by the artificial um, um, administration into the test assay of a tranexamic acid. Um, at that time, we used a protein in that would put, that would um, reverse um, this hyperfibrinolytic pattern. And this was a clear um, indication for us that this coagulation, this coagulopathy, the patient was suffering from was a potentially a TXA or antifibrinolytic and sensitive. And so what is uh, would have been the uh, appropriate intervention for this patient? Obviously, C, tranexamic acid in, 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 in fibrinogen, but um, this is, I would like to highlight that, that it is even important to keep the sequence of administration um, in, your, in your head because you need to block the lytical process in the body first uh, before you add um, substrate um, in, in, in form of fibrinogen um, to, to the patient. And as you can see here, our mention was that the, the patient received two grams of uh, tranexamic acid and four grams of fibrinogen. And this is a dynamic example of an evolving clot um, in the in the viscoelastic testing assays. And you can see here the due to the or as a result of tranexamic acid administration, the hyperfibrinolytic pattern was completely reversed. Um, and um, the, 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 there was an increasing amount of fibrin polymerization evident um, after um, this treatment. Um, and But the patient continued um, to bleed, and so this patient received another two gram of fibrinogen concentrate because um, um, in, at our in our first um, Rotem assay, the maximum clot firmness um, in the FIPTEM was below um, nine millimeters. So we added another two gram of fibrinogen concentrate. And as you can see here, um, the, the, the patient was again responsive to this treatment um, in, in, in form of an increased um, fibrin polymerization process as evidenced here by a higher amplitude in the, in the, in the, in the FIB10 um, test. And once the, 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 the primary operation was finished, um, we were able to hand this over to um, our colleagues from ICU with an almost slightly overcorrected uh, coagulation um, profile. I would like to close my uh, my presentation showing presenting to you some 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 clinical data on the implementation of a Rotem protocol in TBI. Um, this is an example of a prospective case control study in adult isolated TBI craniotomy patients. Um, there were two groups of patients. One was the control was a standard lab, and the other was the case group um, who um, received um, Rotem guided um, treatment. One hundred thirty for patients um, equally distributed um, between both groups, control and case. Um, there was uh, quite a, a substantial number of patients coagulopathic in, in both groups. Um, and in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the case subgroup, um, there were 25 cases um, with rotum abnormalities and 24 of them were treated um, to this algorithm and the adhesion rate um, to the algorithm was um, 85%. Um, percent. And if we look at the results, a um, very small study, but however, um, the use of uh, viscoelastic testing guided um, algorithm led to a consistent coagulation management to improved um, clot quality. All, all Rotem parameters were quite improved um, in the case group. Um, and there was a decreased incidence of, uh, of hemorrhagic progression in those patients as evidenced here and a reduced need um, um, for neurosurgical reintervention in this, in, in the case um, cohort. The last study I would like to share with you was uh, the iTactic um, trial um, that was uh, conducted um, um, across um, six major European trauma centers um, in the context of our pan-European trauma network. Um, this uh, study was conceptualized as a prospective multicenter randomized control trial to compare uh, the hemostatic effect of an evidence-based um, viscoelastic based and um, guided versus an optimized conventional coagulation test guided transfusion algorithm and trauma hemorrhage. We were able to, um, uh, to randomize um, almost 400 uh, patients with clinical bleeding activation of a massive transfusion protocol and initiation of transfusion. 
Um, the follow-up was until discharge um, to uh, until, or uh, 28 and days. And the primary endpoint of this study was the proportions of patients alive and free of massive transfusion at uh, 24 um, hours. Um, and would like to highlight a specific, particular in, in the group we pre-specified with TBI were basically the use um, of, of, of the viscoelastic testing based algorithm was substantially associated with better survival, both at 24 hours and 90 days, um, highlighting the, the, the role of this, of, of this uh, testing assay, especially in, in particular for the TBI population and in guiding um, corresponding and coagulation therapies. So I'm finishing with uh, the not leaving you uh, without some take home messages. So um, exsanguination and TBI remain the major killers of the trauma. Hemorrhagic progression occurs in up to 40 to 60% of all TBI cases. Measures to early monitor and support coagulation and restore hemostasis are key. And this is again, one of the central uh, key messages of the updated European uh, trauma guideline that is also um, um, and targets and um, TBI uh, patients. Viscoelastic functional tests provide fast test results and are superior um, to conventional coagulation assays to pick up coagulopathic uh, signals and goal-directed algorithm based on viscoelastic testing have been introduced, have been published, have been characterized, and may be associated with improved outcomes. And with this, um, I thank you so much for your at uh, attention, listening to me, um, and for the invitation to participate in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, e excellent overview, as, as always, and uh, um, truly important topics. I, I see no new questions in the Q&A, so I just ask you, this take and wrote them, it's, it's, it looks very convincing, and we, we see all the differences. But do you use it as a sole decise, this, this sort of the, the sole measure that you base your decisions on? Or do you put it in the combination with other lab parameters and other, mm. other tests? Or is it basically, this is it, this is what you base your decisions on? So it, 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 it has essentially become a mainstay in our trauma management, regardless whether it is a TBI patient or a trauma patient. So um, what we do is, um, if we, we anticipate a, a, a bleeding problem, um, we automatically run this test. Um, there is a little bit more detail to this test because there is an, an, a further development and it's called Clot Pro. And it offers you a unique opportunity also to measure and to get an idea whether the patient is potentially on a, on a, on a DOAC. And this becomes especially, um, especially interesting in the elderly population, because as you outlined in your introduction, um, vitamin K antagonists go down while the use of DOA is increasing in the elderly population. We see more and more patients on these drugs. And it's hard because then the classic, the conventional coagulation assays, unless you have a specifically calibrated test that, that is calibrated for a specific uh, factor TNA, for example, inhibitor, if you don't have that available, um, the, and, and the measuring level measure leveling concentration is also time consuming. And if you use the clot pro, the specific subtest of the viscoelastic testing clot pro, you have a very good information whether this patient or that whether there is still um, um, coagulative active um, activity, uh, 10A activity in that particular patient, and then you can act uh, appropriately. And I think this offers unique opportunity and enters also. TBI management in the in the arena of precision based individualized uh, therapeutic approaches. All right, thanks. I think for the sake of time, we should move on. So I invite Tony Bell. I, I hear you need to leave the room <laughs> pretty soon. I hope you are able to stay on for, <laughs> for the, your entire presentation. But uh, you, you're truly the expert on tranexamic acid, and also really crucial to know what how to deal with uh, the antiplatelet drugs. So so please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sorry, yes, because I'm boring your room. I'm in a, another conference, but they let me use it. So thank you very much, um, Nicholas, for inviting me to speak today. I think it's a really important topic. A lot of uh, concepts. Um, my, my talk has been made easy by the, obviously yourself and, and Mark, and uh, some of the topics will um, some of the topic will overlap a little bit with, with Bart's presentation later on. But there are a number of um, 
uh, coagulation issues in traumatic brain injury. Uh, these have been discussed already so to some extent, and the, obviously prevention of clock to prevent uh, de develop and expansion, but the management of anticoagulation antiplatelets is really, really topical because we, we deal with it every day and is not something that we can afford to ignore anymore. Uh, you already covered DVT prophylaxis, but we also have special um, sequelae, for example, cerebral sinus thrombosis, which is increasingly recognized as a complication, an early complication of TBI, arterial dissection, and stroke. And we need to come to some consensus what to do about these. And I think there'll be ENS guidance that's going to be coming out next year and probably will carry on being updated every year. Um, we already heard that bleeding is a common complication of TBI and is associated is an independent factor for poor outcome. But also, um, Mark has already alluded to the fact that this is something that often gets worse um, after admission. Um, the data from Center TBI, data from other studies saying actually probably between a quarter and maybe 40% of patients experience further worsening of initial clot. Um, and we also know that early intervention may prevent that kind of enlargement and possibly improve outcomes. All, all to be demonstrated, of course, but uh, conceptually that's correct. Um, the brain is a bit of a devil in terms of quite coagulation and coagulopathy because it triggers coagulopathy, but it also triggers a process similar to DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. So it goes from, uh, we go from hypocoagulability to hypocoagulability, uh, possibly within a short time. And our surgical experience on a dealing with severe trauma um, on a on a surge, on a on a on a theatre bed is actually that the blood, um, the severe, the severely injured brain often bleeds um, despite. Uh, all uh, attempts to uh, control bleeding, and it's, it's often a battle we have um, late in the night. Uh, so what is actually new um, recently is that the, the National Institute for Care and uh, uh, Health and Care Excellence in the UK has finally um, um, released this new update, which actually now currently recommends using tranexamic acid in traumatic brain injury. Before isolated traumatic brain injury was excluded, TXA was recommended for major trauma, but um, TXA was excluded. And this is um, a, it's a, it's a quite a step forward, and obviously this is a slightly controversial topic, but they put together the two most recent trials, CRASH-3, which I, I was a co-investigator on, and a North American trial, and I found that actually the evidence was quite persuasive in favor of giving two grams of TXA to people age 16 or over, uh, if you dealing with a pediatric population is 50 milligrams per kilograms up to 30 milligrams per kilograms, uh, and it's to be given as soon as possible. The recommendations are to give it within two hours. So I wanted to drill a little bit more into um, these results so, because I said it, it is a slightly controversial topic. It is not universally accepted that TXA should be used in uh, in, in isolated TBI. Um, but one one probably one concept to bear in mind: the TXA works if the patient is salvageable. For people with uh, uh, fixed pupils, the, the effect isn't clear. And for people even with one pupil that is not working, maybe that patient doesn't benefit because there's enough uh, bleeding in the brain that this wouldn't respond to TXA. So the results are clear for people that have working pupils. Um, it's also pointing out, it's something you already heard in the previous presentations, most deaths from bleeding and most deaths from TBI actually happen within the first 24 hours and then gradually decline as we keep people um, alive past the first 24 hours. Um, so the benefit in uh, in traumatic brain injury, uh, as I said, it is for people in the crash study least, the people that had a mild to moderate traumatic brain injury, the effect wasn't really clear at all in severe TBI. Um, and so it's a basically is a concept that you're trying to, TXA is most effective for people that you can salvage, less effective in people that uh, have a poor prognosis. Um, and the other concept, he needs to be re given really, really quickly. So t um, the, uh, t the, the crash study randomized people within three hours, um, but it's very clear from the evidence, that accumulating evidence, that actually TXA, if given past the first three hours, it simply doesn't, doesn't work. Um, the North American study showed missed significance for many of the targeted measure, but actually roughly showed the same thing. So when uh, meta-analyzed with it with a crash rate study, you could see that it, it, the, 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 the TXA across both studies improved outcome mortality and disability and limited progression of hemorrhage uh, in in both settings. Um, just a little bit more uh, data to to digest is really uh, where TXA actually works. I said before that the effect is very 
clear in the first 24 hours. But then um, past the 24 hours, you tend to lose more patients from other causes. It's not the bleeding, it's a, could be a ventilator-associated pneumonia um, or other, or other um, uh, infection, other causes. So progressively, the effect of TLA is diluted down. So it, it still reaches significance in many, in many cases, but, but actually TXA works if given early and it only reduces mortality in the first 24 hours. Beyond that, it, it, it doesn't really... Um, do very much. The other question is whether it worked in all in all in all countries and across all settings. And if you look at this, uh, I think it was table on on the left. It seems that in low to middle income countries and in high middle income countries, the effect is very clear in the first twenty four hours. This is kind of dilutional effect, which is more evident in uh, in uh, poorly resourced countries. So in, in in high income countries, if you keep people a patient alive, a patient alive in the first two hours. On the main, the patient goes on to survive. In 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 in, in resource strain countries, more patients are lost um, that can be kept alive uh, past the first to twenty four hours. But the effect is still 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 true um, for um, for the first twenty four hours across all settings. TXA is also cost effective. It obviously costs money to keep people alive. Uh, paradoxically, this is something to to bear in mind. So there are additional costs related to keeping people alive because they need rehab, they need to intensive care management. Um, the cost is obviously higher in, in high-income countries. In, in a country like Pakistan, which is the, the country used here in this example, it only can cost $24 to keep people some somebody alive. The cost of the drug is minimal. It's less than two pounds, and it's only given as a one-off, so it doesn't have to be repeated. Um, so it's actually the drug itself is very cost-effective, but then you have the associated cost of the of uh, obviously associated with doing something positive, which is to keep somebody alive. Um, the question was asked before, what do we do about the, the elderly uh, people? Because this is where we really need to focus our attention as, as, as neurotrauma specialists. So this is where the burden is rapidly increasing. There's a study that's starting now, Crash 4, specifically looking at people age 50 or, or older with, the, with a good GCS, GCS 13 or over. Uh, and looking at um, re bleeding, looking at disability, death, but also the the the, the incidence of dementia because it's associated with uh, TBI, but possibly independently associated with the with the blood load intracranially. So crash four will will look at all of this in in a population that wasn't specifically looked at in previous trials. So maybe the answer will come from this. Uh, the reversal of anticoagulation is going to be discussed in a little bit, but the reversal of antiplatelets is also an, another interesting topic because we many patients come on aspirin or clopidogrel or similar drugs, and and this is also associated with, uh, with worse outcome, uh, particularly multi-BI. Clearly, the association is with multi-BI and severe other factors may drive poor outcome. The risk of death doubles. People with uh, come with uh, anti anti anticoagular antiplatelets, there's a higher risk of chronic subdural hematoma, which is significantly higher, uh, 42 times higher in a, in a particular study. Um, and the and actually, probably there isn't much difference between antiplatelet and anticoagulants in terms of uh, causing additional mortality and, and risk of bleeding. So the question is, what do we do? Um, so the question in regard to antiplatelet is um, if you have somebody on uh, on on or, or anticoagulants, if people are on heparin, is to stop it. And the same goes for warfarin. You're probably going to be hearing a little bit more about it in the, from the next uh, speaker. Um, and the in terms of anti antiplatelet agents um, is uh, is a little bit more complicated. And this is where the the, the, the evidence um, scientific doesn't help us very much, but uh, we know that actually people that have taken just taken aspirin or clopidogrel um, can have um, can have the, the the drug or its metabolites that are still active on circulating for um, for some time for several hours or possibly for several days, and this can't always be measured. Um, so. We know that the any platelets that you give may be rendered ineffective by the presence of these active metabolites of the drug. So if you can wait, the advice is to wait if the patient doesn't need to be rushed to see it, uh, um, wait um, as long as you can afford to wait safely for the for the antiplatelets uh, to wear off, uh, possibly more than a day for um, for clopidogrel, but uh, um, hematologists would advise us to wait perhaps for three, four days even for those active metabolites to disappear. Um, and then the question is, um, 
what what can you do to reverse it? As in our units, we tend to give platelet uh, platelet infusion, which um, is not uh, risk free, is associated with uh, um, several risks. So it always is a balance of risk that you need to consider. So we tend to give one on induction, one intraoperatively, and possibly another one after after theatre. Bearing in mind this platelet may not function correctly due to the to the drug in circulation, uh, but it certainly um, it, it probably will be active for a short period of time enough to maybe get through the, through the operation. It's a balance of risk because platelets are also rich of other factors, and not all of these are good in terms of uh, promoting survival. Um, so what, what do we do? So reversing the calculation uh, should be done wherever possible um, and whenever, wherever there is time to do that. Um, one point that may be repeated in the next um, talk is actually using INR as a guide is not always a, um, reliable. Even an INR, uh, INR less than two may not be a good guide against um, clot development. And maybe the uh, more scientific approach you just heard about using using a hematology service, but also using a Rotem or a TEG can really guide that process much more scientifically. Um, quick reversal may reduce mortality and may, may particularly indicate in salvageable patients. Um, <clears throat> Platelet transfusion in many studies does not reduce mortality, but it is can be seen as a temporizing measure. This will probably need to be analyzed a little bit more scientifically in uh, in further research. Um, and the, in terms of what is actually uh, safe to do, and I think this may be covered later on, the other question is when do you restart people on, uh, on, on anticoagulants uh, or antiplatelets? And there's going to be some debate around this, but most research, not just from TBI studies, but from uh, uh, other sectors of medicine, is actually that after after um, a week, 10 days, and certainly after two weeks, it, it, the, the risk um, is very much in favor of restarting um, anti antiplatelets and anticoagulants, because the risk of rebleeding is actually there, possibly in the first day, possibly in the first two, three days. Uh, beyond that, that risk is, is certainly exceeded by uh, the risk of uh, thromboembolic events or cardiac events or stroke in people that need need prophylaxis. So re re resumption of previous therapy at one or two weeks, although we often feel nervous about it when trying to avoid rebleeding, may be justified in, 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 many, in many cases. And there is good evidence, as I said, from other studies that, um, that balance flips um, between one and two weeks uh, after the, uh, the traumatic event in favor of uh, restarting oral anticoagulants or oral antiplatelets. So I'm going to stop there and um, we'll take any questions if they don't kick me out of the room. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Tony, and um, brilliant, uh, brilliant talk. We had one question for you. The exact mechanisms of um, trianxamic acid, uh, can you just explain that? To so the, it's a, it's a, it's a, in, 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 in trianxamic acid stabilizes fibrinogen, stabilizes the clot by stopping the action of plasminogen, which is the, is a natural cleaver of, 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 of the clot, effectively. It is a, is a protein in the enzymes that degrades and demolishes the clot and re basically restarts the bleeding. So it stops the um, uh, fibrinolysis effective by uh, inhibited plasminogen is conversion to plasmin. It may have other effects on uh, on cytokines or metalloproteinases or an anti-inflammatory effect. Um, the the, the anti-inflammatory effect of TXA has been documented in other studies on, uh, for example, in uh, um, um, in um, sort of women's health, in sort of uh, menorrhagia, for example, and um, and in Japan, is actually TXA is also licensed as as a, an anti-migraine medication for its anti-inflammatory properties. So there may be there's a little bit more that we, we meets the eye, a little bit more that we uh, we understand around TXA, but the main action is by the inhibition of plasminogen and, and, and fibrinolysis. And as well, just one one quick question for me. Um, there's no pressing. I've used it myself uh, typically after platelet transfusion, but there's also some concern from the anesthesiologist that reduces blood pressure or whatever. But what's your experience with desmopressin? Is it something? So the the we don't actually use um, desmopressin in uh, in in my uh, in my units, but it's I know it's, it's used in other units. Um, 
uh, I think the action of the small pressing is to mobilize the ex existing pool of platelets. So it actually, it, it does actually increase the number, um, whether the platelets begin to function better. That's another, that's probably the, the, the yeah, I guess is the, is the real question, but it certainly um, has an effect on mobilizing platelets. So we don't actually use it because of its other effects of desmopressin and um, on uh, electrolyte um, metabolism and blood pressure. Um, but so I know it's obviously it, it is um, well accepted and well used in other units. So I don't see things as solid evidence for or against it. So if you use it, probably I'll say, you know, carry on until <laughs> we get evidence in favor or to the contrary. All right, thanks. I think we should move on to move, move on to our last speaker, our our chair of the neurotrauma section, Bart Petre, on the reverse and restart of anticoagulant drugs following TBI. There was a question in the Q and A about restarting, so but I think it's uh, we can maybe continue that discussion after your your talk here, Bart. So so welcome and pleased to have you here. Okay, well, thanks, uh, Niklas, and uh, for the invitation, and I really feel on re uh, feel really honored uh, to be in such a highly regarded company. Um, so my talk is on reversal and restart of anticoagulant uh, drugs. Uh, these are my disclosures, but they do not relate to the current uh, presentation. So first of all, um, while there is a, a significant increase of the incidence of TBI in elderly, we all see it in our figures in our hospitals, and that comes with a um, the effect also that we see more patients that sustain the TBI that were on anticoagulants or also on antiplatelets. Uh, and we know that the risk of expansion of uh, the intracranial hemorrhages increases by that. So there is a need for a reversal. But on the other hand, and it was um, already uh, emphasized by Niklas, uh, is that particularly in the older population, uh, there may be a very strict indication for early restart because of thromboembolic risk in these patients. And also they may run into venous thromboembolic complications uh, during their post-traumatic um, course. And to set the scene a little bit, uh, this is a systematic review by Greg Horiluk and his colleagues. Uh, this is not just on trauma, it's it's all intracranial uh, hemorrhages uh, he collected in literature. It's from a couple of years ago. Um, and on the uh, top right hand side, you see the uh, complications. So hemorrhagic in red and thrombotic in blue. And you see that hemorrhagic complications, when they occurred, usually occurred, or in the majority of these patients, occurred quite early before day three or before they before, in the first 72 hours. And when there was a thromboembolic complication, about in half of the patients that occurred later, but also as early in half of the patients of day three to five. So we should remind that. And when he related that to the start or restart of anticoagulants, he found that um, in patients with the hemorrhagic complication, sometimes it was not stopped or it was restarted within 48 hours, which was probably not the greatest idea. Um, but in patients uh, that had a thromboembolic complication, it was sometimes started as early as day five or a little bit later. And that was in some of these patients too late, as you can see, if you combine both graphs. And as neurosurgeons, we tend to try to avoid hemorrhagic complications. We are always a little bit afraid of starting or uh, restarting too early, uh, but we disregard a little bit the thromboembolic risks. And we should really be aware of that. There are these patients, and particularly older patients, that really have high risks of arterial thromboembolic events. Patients with a CHAT score of more than four, and particularly if they're more than six, and patients with mechanical cardiac valves, and particularly the mitral ones, but also patients that have drug eluting stents if they were placed quite recently um, and um, uh, um, biological cardiac valves also when they were placed recently. Also the risk for ongoing venous thromboembolic events and that was pointed out by Niklas, I won't really repeat it, but that's not necessarily low. This is old uh, data um, where you see that it can go as high as 70% as in patients post um, TBI. Um, and this is a more recent study where the incidence of a VTE came down to 9%. So it, it doesn't come down to zero. Uh, with prophylaxis, it's, prophylaxis, obviously, it is lower than it was in those older days. But it's 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 about 9-10% now. And it comes, as you see um, in the in the table, uh, at median uh, intervals of day 7 uh, to 5 um 
post trauma. And there's a clear relation with a delayed start of VTE prophylaxis. And that's really important. And why is there a delayed start? Usually uh, because people, neurosurgeons, are afraid of expansion of uh, post-traumatic bleedings in the first couple of days after the TBI. Uh, so the prophylaxis is really effective. And it's when you really start late that those people will potentially develop a VTE um, complication and may then need uh, anticoagulation. So about reversal, these are guidelines uh, from spontaneous intracerebral uh, hemorrhages uh, to start off with. There's a bit of analogy there. Uh, and you see that there's clear um, well um, recommendation uh, to stop anticoagulation, to discontinue it immediately and have a rapid reversal. And in vitamin K antagonist, that should be done by prothrombin complex concentrate, PCC. Uh, and that is preferred over fresh frozen plasma. And there's several papers, several studies that really highlight in the forest plot that um, the uh, outcome in terms of stopping the bleeding, uh, improving the coagulation, but also the clinical outcome of patients is better when they receive PCC over fresh frozen plasma. And it's also recommended to immediately start intravenous um, administration of vitamin K, but obviously that won't be enough. So PCC has to be uh, added to that usually. Um, what about Novo7? So factor 7A, there have been some trials in that and spontaneous ICH, but the effect actually is unclear. There is conflicting uh, data emerging from the randomized trials that have been done. And for trano, uh, tranexamic acid, I refer to Tony's uh, talk. Obviously, if you can administer within three hours in TBI, uh, there is an advantage. That advantage was not so clear in spontaneous uh, ICH. For heparin, heparin has a short half-life, so stop it immediately. And um, after a couple of hours, the, the effect will be gone. Uh, it is reasonable in some situations to give protamin when needed. And that also is true in low molecular weight heparin. Protamin may be considered to partially reverse uh, the anticoagulant effect, so it may be helpful. Then for the DOAX, we have the anti-10A inhibitors. And there, uh, there is emerging evidence on the use of andexanet alpha. Uh, that can uh, use as a um, antidotant of that. And for the direct antithrombin uh, ones, uh, so dabigatran, et cetera, there's idarizuzumab uh, that can be applied. And that is not available and not reimbursed in all countries, but at least in Belgium and in our hospital uh, it is. And that is preferred. If you don't have it, or maybe even in addition, PCC uh, can be considered. Uh, and if patients have taken their inhibitor quite recently, also activated charcoal may be um, considered to uh, stop the absorption of that. And in really uh, well serious uh, situations uh, where you're at the, with the back against the wall, then um, uh, renal uh, display uh, replacement therapy can be considered. But that's quite rare, uh, obviously. Going to TBI, then there is a. Uh, consensus statement from Austria by Wiegle and colleagues. Um, and they um, stated that for uh, vitamin K antagonist and TBI, uh, well, it should be stopped. Obviously, PCC should be administered in addition with um, vitamin K um, intravenously. And for DOAX, in case of dabigratran, idarucizumab can be used, as said, and in the anti 10A um, drugs, uh, they but it's a bit an older consensus statement. They advocate uh, the use of protrombin uh, complex concentrate, while nowadays we know that um, Andexanet can be uh, used. And this is a trauma guideline, so not specifically TBI, but it's on trauma. What about um, vitamin K? Well, it says the same as in spontaneous ICH, so um, uh, administer PCC uh, in adjunction with uh, vitamin K. Um, there is clear benefit of PCC over fresh frozen plasma, also in TBI. And what about DOAX? Well, again, uh, for uh, Rivaroxaban, Apixaban, etc. So the anti 10A um, drugs, um, Andexanet Alpha uh, can be used. And when you're dealing with uh, Dabigatran and the other um, anti 2, a um, drugs, idarucizumab, uh, can be used and is recommended. Um, there is still, though, uh, because 
situations can be complex and can be diverse. There is still, still some, some, some uncertainty. And this is a very nice study illustrating uh, that. It's a consensus statement by a group of um, clinicians. Uh, and you see um, in, in the columns, there's a high bleeding or low bleeding versus low thromboembolic or high thromboembolic risk. You see if there is a high bleeding risk, usually it is considered appropriate um, to not just stop the uh, vitamin K antagonist, but also use PCC and not just stop the DOAC, but also use the reversal agents. Now, in case of a uh, low bleeding risk, because not all TBI is associated with the hemorrhage and not all hemorrhage is considered serious enough. Um, so it may be considered appropriate in low bleeding risk situations um, to just stop the vitamin K antagonist without PCC and to stop the DOAC uh, with no reversal agents. Now, obviously, this is not really clear cut science. This is not also based on data. This is a consensus um, exercise, but it just illustrates the uncertainty about it. And also, uh, even more, when there's a high thromboembolic risk, you see that um, in most of these situations, um, there was no clear answer uh, in the group uh, because it was considered to be uncertain. What about restarting or starting anticoagulants following TBI? Well, are there any guidelines? Unfortunately, not. There is um, this uh, paper on uh, spontaneous um, ICH and uh, just to, to show, to set the scene a little bit. So what they advise it's from the European Society of Cardiology um, is that decisions are individualized and should be based on a close collaboration between specialists of different disciplines. And I go back to that Austrian consensus statement. There they emphasize that prophylaxis should be instituted as early as possible. And what they state here is to start low molecular weight heparins at 24 hours when there has been a stable TBI or a stable CT scan, in other words, that was also emphasized by Niklas. But for the re actual restart of therapeutic anticoagulation, uh, they could give no definite recommendation. It's individual. It should be decided on a case-by-case -case, um, well, decision. So therefore, the uh, trauma section of the EANS undertook a, a, the, well, uh, took the initiative uh, to start with a systematic review and um, has the plan to develop a guideline specific on this item. When can you safely start or restart uh, antithrombotic drugs? And so we try to tackle first in a literature study the following questions. When is it safe to resume anticoagulants or antiplatelets? And when is it safe to start in uh, uh, TE complication situations, AC or AP drugs in different subgroups. There's patients with mild TBI with a hemorrhage on the CT scan, obviously also patients with moderate and severe TBI, but then there's also patients with mild TBI with a normal admission CT scan, the so-called minor uh, TBI. And then there's subdural hematomas where you do not only have the immediate risk for hematoma expansion, but also the risk uh, in time to develop a chronic uh, subdural hematoma. So we included studies with at least 10 TBI patients uh, that were on antithrombotic drugs and where it was not stopped or started or restarted and the time of start or restart was documented. And also the outcome in terms of clinical or radiological parameters was uh, documented in the studies. And you can see also that we exclude chronic subdurals and also VTE prophylaxis because there's quite a little bit, quite a bit of uh, systematic reviews and guidelines already on uh, prophylaxis. Now, we realized in discussing that, that there are a lot of situations, uh, and we ended up with 18 PICO tables to try to cover them all. And where are we now? Well, we're not ready. We're actually in uh, the process of the full text uh, screening. Now, for the sake of the EANS meeting two weeks ago and this um, webinar, I looked in the database at those original studies where the start or restart of antiviral coagulant drugs within 28 days was documented, excluding minor TBI and blunt cerebrovascular injury. And I ended up, as you see, with 10 original studies, and I will quickly go over them. You see on the right top, the number of patients, then in the middle, the hemorrhagic complications, and then at the left bottom, the start time post TBI. I try to be quick for the sake of time. So there is one prospective study with uh, 167 patients. I think it's the best evidence we have. They had a clinical deterioration at about 10% of the patients. And those with deterioration had a median start uh, time of 4.5 days. 
the patients without deterioration, there was a median time of 11. The rest are retrospective studies, 105 patients, about five had expansion of the hematoma, so about 5%, and they had a median start day of eight and a median start day of six days after a stable head CT scan. So that's also important information. This is a study on 82 patients, about 10% had a, a hemorrhagic complication. They had a mean start date of seven days, and there was a clear association uh, of bleeding with shorter time to start the AC. These are 72 patients, about 10% again had worsening scans, but without neurological worsening. Uh, the progression patients had a median start date of 5.5. When there was no progression, it was a median start date of 10. These are 46 patients. And all the expansions here were seen in subdural hematomas, three in the early group, two in the late group, and there was no difference uh, between both groups. These are 35 patients, only one patient with hemorrhagic expansion, and these authors recommended to start between 7 and 14 days. These are children. Uh, Niklas also pointed at the situation of children. That is a bit specific, 37 children. Worsening was seen in three children. And the conclusion of these authors was that the start of the anticoagulant did not help for clot resolution. So they recommend actually not, they, they recommend prophylaxis, but uh, not therapeutic anticoagulation because it was of not no benefit. Uh, although they also reported that the risk of the AC was rather low. And then further on, 35 patients. Um, Average start date 9.5. Four patients here had a hemorrhagic complication. There was a clear association with patients being older, lower GCS, larger hematoma volume, larger SDH diameter, and anticoagulation started earlier. And also patients with a complication were more often thrombocytopenic. So it's not just the mechanism uh, on which the anticoagulants work. It's, it's more like the total um, coagulation cascade that you should take into account. 35 patients in this study, only one with expansion. It was a subdural with an average start date of nine. And 26 patients, only one again with expansion with an average start date of 11.9, so almost 12. And so that's that's the studies. So all studies actually report a low risk of initiation of AC at average intervals of eight to 12 days. The best data is from one prospective study where they came to the same conclusion. And the odds ratio for deterioration hemorrhagic deterioration um, was 0.9 for each additional day from the start, which means that this is almost vanished by 11 days. Risk factors for progression were patients being older, lower GCS, larger volumes, thrombocytopenia, and obviously anticoagulation started earlier. And one study, and that's also very important to emphasize reports, safety at a median interval of six days post-stable CT. So if you start from the hemorrhage is not getting worse and count from there, probably six days is enough. Now, some considerations, it is, and that's what is sometimes thought wrongly, it is not needed to wait for complete hemo hematoma resolution. And in the waiting process, not only just consider the hemorrhagic risks, but definitely also um, consider the uh, thromboembolic risks as already stated. And beware, a no-risk situation actually does not exist. And this is an example from uh, the hospital quite recent. This is a patient uh, that was under um, um, vitamin K antagonist for a mechanical mitral valve. Uh, and you see the contusions on day zero. So anticoagulation was reversed. And because there was no real worsening at day one, we started with enoxaparin in a prophylactic dose. And there was no worsening from there on the CT scans. So at day seven, we started intermediate inoxaparin doses. And at day 10, started therapeutic doses. And the patient is doing well uh, without any hemorrhagic or clinical deterioration. So we are still in the process of further literature analysis and uh, guideline development. We think we'll be ready by the end of next year. And so to conclude, in hemorrhagic TBI, for vitamin K antagonists, administer PCC and IV vitamin K. And for DOAX, it's actually the uh, anti-dose um, drugs that are more in the picture now. For the anti-10A drugs, start Andexanet. And for anti-2A, start Idarazuzumab. For prophylaxis, it's probably very safe. And there's several papers and already meta-analysis and also guidelines to start within 48 hours after a stable CT scan. 
For restarting, that's a bit more complex. And so the guideline development is still in process. It will always be a balance between bleeding and thromboembolic risks. But it seems from what we looked at sufficiently safe after 10 to 12 days to start anticoagulant drugs, considering the risk factors and following an, some safe interval of a couple of days. And the, the paper that clearly mentioned it said six, six days um, with stable imaging. These are all the collaborators that helped so far for the literature screening. So thank you very much. And uh, I quickly also want to take the opportunity to invite you to the Neurotrauma Update meeting in Madrid in February. Thank you. Thank you, Bart. Uh, excellent, excellent presentation. Thanks for providing guidelines and um, guidance on a really difficult topic. We actually have some questions also for, for you, Mark. Thanks for staying on. Um, Tony, actually, he was kicked out of the room, so he couldn't stay any longer. So first to, to you, Mark, we got uh, we, we, we don't uh, we haven't only reached um, European um, participant. We also have the chair of the um, WFNS uh, Neurotrauma Committee asking a question. So Andrew Reisner, he asked about the tegrotum uh, viscoelastic mm -hmm. test in pediatric mm -hmm. patients. What's your experience with that? Um, yes, it, 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 essentially the whole concept of our algorithms in supplementing um, specific coagulation factors according to specific rotum traces, it's largely the same in the pediatric population and in the elderly. So, but but the, the trigger values might be a little bit different because the coagulation system, especially in the pediatric population with increasing age changes. Um, and there is a, a colleague of us, uh, he's called Thorsten Haas, he's from Zurich, and he has dig quite into this field. Um, and he came up with, you know, this, um, let's say, age groups showing that the coagulation system is quite different and therefore substitution and supplementation might follow a little bit a different approach based on our findings. Um, and he published reference values for specific age groups in the pediatric population. And this has been translated then into, um, into our algorithms. And there are specific um, algorithms, um, also for the pediatric trauma population. There is one that came out from the Riggs Hospital from Jakob Jens Baller from Copenhagen and his group. Um, and there is one from Australia. Um, and you, you may want to, to, to look at these, these two publications and in addition to Torsten Haas's uh, classification um, paper. Um, because if, if I would I expand on this, it probably would, you know, take much more time, but I really uh, recommend to you to reference and to consult those three publications. There's one from Jakob Stinsballer and Per Johansson from Copenhagen, one from Jean Reynolds in, um, in uh, Gold Coast um, um, Trauma Center from Brisbane, Australia, and look up the, the work by Thorsten Haas from, from Zurich in Switzerland. There was another question regarding taking road, I mean, in case you don't have it, uh was a can periodic testing of fibrinogen and D-dimer uh, levels serve as a guide to give tranexamic acid or... or so, so, yeah, so so in the absence of take rotum, um, you may want to, to, to look at fibrinogen levels according to the Klaus method. And what the, the European trauma guideline that's also valid for the, in, in part for the TBI population, but obviously mostly for the trauma population, uh, we suggest to supplement fibrinogen when the, the level is below 1.5 gram per deciliter. Um, for the D-dimer, as already outlined by, by, um, by Nicholas in his um, introduction, D-dimers are so unspecific. They, are, they, are, they are go up and down in, in every trauma case because they are quite of a, a natural response to, to, to injury. So, but what, what we also have suggested in the in the European trauma guideline to use the, the conventional coagulation assays, for example, like PT, APTT. And when they are 1.5 times above the normal reference range, you may want to consider following a, an FFP transfusion-based strategy. For tranexamic acid, 
I think we only have to take Rotem available to assess hyperfibrinolysis. But if you think uh, more pathophysiologically, uh, um, the main driver that drives fibrinolysis is hyperperfusion because this activates the protein C pathway and this then drives fibrinolysis. So if you have a clinical patient with a bleeding problem who is actually in shock, I would be very liberal in administering at least one gram of fibrinogen to this patient because CRASH-3 basically also given it empirically has shown a benefit at least in the mild to moderate severely injured uh, TBI patient population. What well, that also works in the in the, in the more severely, it's it's open discussion. But at least in those patients, you potentially do not any ha additional harm to these patients. So I would be very liberal if you have a a, a patient with the with the with the, with the bleeding, active bleeding, and uh, who is who is in shock, give one gram of TXA quite empirically and liberal. So these are my answers to your question. There's one more question, best interval between the two testing. In, for the tech rotem, we, we, we recommend to do the next rotem to the next assay, to run the next assay after five, 15 minutes after intervention. And this might also hold true for the, for the conventional assays as well. So do your intervention, wait for 15, 20 minutes, do your blood, draw your next blood sample, send it to the lab or whatever, and see what it what it what it gives you as a therapeutic effect of your intervention. Thank you. All right, perfect. Thank you. Also, one question for for you, then, Bart. Um, when do you when you restart anticoagulants or antiplatelets, do you rescan the patient before you do it? Always. So yeah, yes. Well, the the answer is definitely yes. Uh, because you want a stable CT scan before you would do that. Uh, definitely yes. Yes. And now uh, Tony had to leave, but uh, it was a one question. Can we use tranexamic acid and platelets in elderly with chronic sedurals to improve outcome in patients that are on, on aspirin? So I don't know, your, your take on that. You can also comment that. Did you have any thoughts on that part? <laughs> um, well, there's a study on uh, tran tranexamic acid, but we don't have the results yet. So, so we have to wait for that. Um, so uh, to be honest, I don't know. And it's if you consider that um, the mode of action is rather well early on, uh, as as has been pointed out here in different lectures. I I'm really curious what would come out of a study in chronic subdurals. But I I cannot. Maybe maybe you can you have an idea, Nicholas, what uh, or or a, a certain idea in a certain direction on that. Um, well, not, no, no evidence, but uh, aspirin per se is not a, the big problem, to be honest. I think exactly. operated patients still on it. Uh, and But if we can, we wait five days. We, we, said we, we stop the aspirin and then we, we do surgery. But probably we can, you know, we can do it with uh, aspirin still going, to be honest. So, but uh, trying some gas is super safe, it's super cheap. And so I wouldn't be, I would be very liberal to give it if I would anticipate some bleeding problems. The more issues when they are on clopidogrel, and particularly like ticagrel oil, which is uh, really difficult to manage, then you need to be more aggressive. So, but in, in case of those patients where we really cannot stop um, uh, sort of antiplatelet medication, we always consider MMA embolizations. Uh, so instead, for those reasons, stents and things like that. So we've done it, uh, you know, quite liberally as well in those patients. And then you can continue with these with these drugs. If that was the answer or not, but um, I see no no further questions or comments here. Huge thanks to all participants and to all the panelists, and particularly to ENS office, particularly Anna Rek has been amazing in, in setting this up as well. So any other comments from you panelists or are we happy with this? <laughs> I think we were quite complete. <laughs> Right. So um, thanks again. Really appreciate it. And thanks to all participants. If there are further questions, you can just email us and we can try to respond to that. Okay. okay. Have a good That's one. Okay. All the best. Thank all you. Right. Bye -bye. Thank you.